face-to-face -face worship center. I'm Eartha Page. It's 2021, the year to occupy. And we are thankful to be in the second month of the year. I pray you are still ready to step into your promise in 2021 as Pastor Tony continues to show us how to occupy this year. Our services are aimed at hosting your face-to-face -face God encounter and to be transformed by his word and his presence. Because of COVID precautions, our physical church is closed, but here we are virtually. When our physical church reopens, you have a standing invitation to join us any Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We are located at 9121 Piscataway Road, Clinton, Maryland, Suite 4B. Today, Pastor Tony will be continuing the new sermon series entitled Breaking the Cycles. Whether you were here last week or if this is your first time joining us, prayerfully you are ready to hear some of the principles that will help you break those cycles that just aren't breaking. But before we hear these principles, we will continue to celebrate our Black History Month. We will be hearing from one of our very own leaders. Administrative Pastor Rose will be sharing her personal experience growing up in the South, as well as highlighting a great figure in our history. Just as a reminder, please visit us at our website at f2fwc.org and also like and share the services today. And please visit our prior services on our YouTube channel at Face to Face Worship Center. So, are you ready to go in today's service? Our dynamic music ministry is going to prepare our hearts to receive. So let's go. Good afternoon, Face to Face family and friends. Thank you for tuning in to worship this afternoon. We're gonna have us a good time. We're just gonna say that God is a friend of ours and we're a friend of his. And yeah, let's get it.
God, we thank you for allowing us to call you a friend and you being a brother to us and a father to us, even in the midst of a storm, God. We just thank you for always being our companion and being right there for us, being a loyal partner, a loyal sidekick through it all, God. God, we thank you and we bless your name because you're the only one who could have stayed with us the whole time when our friends left, when our family left, you stayed right by our side, God, and we thank you every single day for what you've done for us and what you're going to do in the future, God. God, we thank you. God bless you this Sunday afternoon. I'm Pastor Tony, and I'm so delighted that you've chosen to worship with Face to Face Worship Center. Whether you're watching via Facebook Live, our YouTube channel, our website, YLC TV, or wherever you may be viewing, we are delighted that you've allowed us to host your Face to Face God encounter. Now, as you can see, I'm in my home gym, and you'll understand that a little better when we bring forth the message. But before that occurs, I've come to invite you to worship with us in your giving. As I've shared many times, giving is a part of our worship service because it says to God that we're giving back what he has blessed us with. And so I want to invite you to be a part of this worship experience. Now, I will share with you, you will have multiple opportunities to give throughout the broadcast. But right now, this time has been set aside for you to specifically give your tithes and your offerings. Face to face is good ground. And anytime you plant into good ground, you can expect a harvest. So it's our custom that we talk to our money. Some words are going to come up in a moment and you can join us in this declaration that we speak over our money. Are you ready to repeat after me? The word should be right at the bottom of your screen. I walk in financial abundance. God supplies all of my needs, not half of them, but all of them. Satan, take your hands off my finances. Finances, I command you to be loose from the world system. Because I give tithes and offerings, I am blessed and not cursed. Therefore, God will see to it that I always have more than enough for myself and to bless others. I pray you repeated those words after me. Now, here at Face to Face, there are several ways that you can give. And again, this information should also be coming across the bottom of your screen. But you can give via Givelify. Look for Face-to-Face -face Worship Center. You can give via our cash app, dollar sign, F2FWC. You can go to our website, f2fwc.org, and look for the donate link. Click it and give there. Or you can text your offering to F2FWC Give at 1-888-364-4483. Again, all of that information should scroll at the bottom of your screen. Thank you for being a blessing in the offering, and let's go into further worship, and then we're going to come back with the word of God. Come on, we got some more worship for you. Hello, this is Administrative Pastor Rose. I am coming to you today for the celebration of Black History Month that we continue in doing the month of February. It's an annual celebration that we celebrate the achievements of our African Americans and also it's a great time to recognize the role that they played in U.S. history. And I am excited. We've come a long ways by faith. We know that it was only God that brought us this far, but we have a long ways to go. But we've made huge strides as we even look today to our role that we impact U.S. history with our vice president. So I'm excited, but it always hasn't been this way. And I can reflect on the time when I was young and I grew up in the South world. My mom would chastise us. We would go out and make sure that we did things properly as far as the Caucasian people were concerned. Uh, we had to um, not 
um, act like you were <laughs> were not civilized. You had to give them respect by calling them Mr., Mrs., yes ma'am, no ma'am. And also my brothers would have to open the doors when they went into buildings. And I think that that was hard for me because I wanted to know why we have to do all of this. We are people just like they are, but that was, those were the times. And now that we've made strides and giant leaps, we still have work to be done. But God has brought us a mighty long ways by his grace. So now I want to just share with you a few of the in inventions and products that were invented by African Americans and see if you can recognize some of them. The air conditioning unit, the baby buggy, the ch clothes dryer, the curtain rod support, the door stopper, the fire escape ladder, the fire extinguisher, did you know that? And also the gas mask and the guitar were all made by black people, African Americans as we are. And um, today I want to share with you just briefly about someone that impacted me during this, this year, Black History Month, as I was doing some study and looking into our history and our culture, that his name is Benjamin Banneker. Benjamin Banneker is a black architect and he was hired by George Washington the President of the United States to help design Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. And he was highly recommended that he would be on, that Benjamin would be, Banneker would be on the committee. Well, the former designer of the committee to design Washington, D.C., he decided that he was leaving and he took his plans and he took all the work that he had done and, 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 and left. But Benjamin Banneker was able to lay out and complete all the streets, the parks, and the major buildings. And not only was he able to do this from memory, but he also did it in just two days. Oh, wow, isn't that amazing? Well, Mr. Banneker's grandmother was from England, and she immigrated here to Baltimore, Maryland. Yay, the DMV on the map. And she married one of her slaves, and so did her daughter also married one of the slaves and that was Benjamin Banneker's father and mother and he was born in 1731. Well praise God he went on to do some great things. He also um, was a mathematician, an engineer and who knows Benjamin Banneker he designed the first clock and it lasted and worked perfectly for 40 years and I'm excited because for 10 years he published the annual Farmer's Almanac, which he um, did all the calculations himself. And I'm excited because being a country girl, we depended on the annual Farmer's Almanac that we will govern our lives and growth and products and farm by. So I take a salute black history. I salute black African Americans and all that we do. God bless you. Worship thee, O Lamb of God, who he died for me, who is sinless and less mercy. So daily I I 
He wanted to show me something in preparing for this message. You remember how God took Jeremiah to the potter's house and there showed him the magnitude of his love for Israel as he demonstrated as the potter was at the wheel managing, handling the clay? Well, so here we are in my home gym. Now, I have all of this equipment that I believe from what I've been told and what I've seen from others. This equipment can help me get in shape. It can even possibly help me produce some muscles. I have it here in my basement. I have access to it. But the equipment just being in my basement and me having access to it and believing that it can help me get in shape and develop muscles will not develop muscles for me. Well, so is it the same with faith. Now, I hear you saying, okay, tell me more, Pastor Tony. Okay. I've come to realize that faith is a principle. And I'm going to share a few principles with you today. And then I'm going to work out in my home gym after church. If that's all right with you. Now, I, I first want to define for you what a principle is. A principle is defined as a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as the foundation for a system of belief or behavior or for a chain of reasoning. It, it, it controls how we think. You remember in our first series, we talked about your truth. Now, what did I just say to you? I, I, I hear basically um, you saying, now make it plain, Pastor Tony. Well, a principle is a truth that you hold to, and that truth serves as the foundation for your belief system and controls your behavior. The principle of faith is defined in Hebrews 11 as the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence or proof of things not seen. This is how it's worded in the Amplified Bible. King James, he, he says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence not seen. The challenge for many, however, is how can we have assurance for something that we only hope for and don't see it? It seems like an oxymoron, some would think. Well, we must first understand that when the Hebrew talks or the Hebrew text talks about assurance, the Greek word is hypostatis. This word is made up of status, which means to stand, and hypo, which means under. So assurance is that which stands under a foundation or a ground on which one builds their hope. So my faith is not built on a wish. It's not wishing upon a star or wishful thinking, hoping that what I wish for will come true. No, that's not faith. That, that if you please, is a fairy tale or make-believe. The song that comes to my mind when I think about foundation is, my hope is built on nothing less. Then Jesus' blood and righteousness. I, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus. Name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. How many of you remember that old hymn? Now, now the way we can have hope is, is not because we are wishing upon a star but because our faith is standing on a sure foundation. 
If we were to look at the King James text, when, 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 when he uses the verbiage, faith is the substance, substance of things hoped for. That word substance has or had a technical meaning in the business world in the first century. It actually referred to one's property or their effects. It is a legal term, title deed. Faith is the title deed of the things I'm hoping for. Now, what purpose does a title deed serve? Well, when you own property, you are given the title deed to show your ownership. It is yours and no one can take it from you. So the understanding is your faith is the title deed that God holds on our behalf. It is his promised land that, that, that no one can take what he has promised from us. There, there is no persuasion or no pressure that can change our stance or position. If God promised something, you and I can stand under it. You, you and I own something that we have not seen, but it, no, it does not less or no less means that it's ours. Now, now faith is the God-given ownership of our hopes that we receive prior to taking full possession. It, it, if you receive ownership given to you by the promises of God and you maintain the truth of that ownership, Eventually, what will happen is what we own will be manifested. I just described for you the basis of faith. But the problem at hand is we often move in the cycle of doubt. The cycle of doubt makes the truth of faith inactive or like a roller coaster ride and down, up and down and around in our lives. Beloved, it is only by faith that we can please God and experience abundant life. So the problem is the cycle of doubt. It is one that's constant, frequent, and persistent. It rides the back of every believer and keeps us halted between two opinions. But today I hope to show you how to break the cycle. Now I first want us to understand faith. So as I often do, I'm going to present you with a question. How does faith work? Now, this is a crucial, crucial question that, that must be answered if we are to see the promises of God revealed in our lives. Why is it that God's promises seem to be elusive? Running from us, never, we're never able to obtain it. It's like it, the promises play hide and seek. Let's dig in and find out. Now, we all know or have heard about Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 that, that says, but without faith it is impossible to please God. And most of you, I would venture to say, have heard of Romans chapter 14 verse 23, the B clause of that verse that says that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So there's a high premium on faith. But to really understand how this faith thing works, I want to share with you, beloved, that faith is more than believing. Mm, I know, I, I just got a lot of your attention from that statement. I know, I, I hear you now wondering, what is he saying? I, matter of fact, I hear some of you saying in the voice of Gary Coleman from Different Strokes, what you talking about, Willis? Well, I want you to stay with me. And I'm going to explain. I want you to first understand faith in Greek is defined or it, it is pistis. 
It means persuasion, credence, moral conviction of the truthfulness of God. It is one's profession or confession. And the word believe in Greek is pistu, meaning to have faith in, upon, or with respect to a person or a thing. There's the implication of trusting or entrust committed to, right? So now you'll notice that the definitions of faith and believe are basically the same. But in actuality, there's a difference between faith and believing. As far as the earth is from the sun, which is about 93 million miles, so is faith from believing. Now remember, we're talking about breaking the cycle of doubt. Now many of us in our understanding have, have made belief and faith synonymous. We have thought that if, 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 you're ta if we're talking about belief or believing, that we're also talking about faith. And I submit to you that this thought process can be a deterrent to us operating in actual faith and the fullness that God has for us. It is important to understand the difference because if not, you will think you're operating in faith when in fact all you're doing is believing. Stay with me. I'm, I'm going to get you. Now, faith and believing, they must work together, but they aren't the same. Let me give you an illustration. Let me share with you, I'm going to give you a story. A, a, a man walks into face-to-face -face worship center while service is going on, and he walks down to the front of the church looking strange. He's very initiated, looking sickly, matter of fact, looking weak. He looks like he could die at any minute. Really looks bad. He, he looks, matter of fact, like he's starved. He walks up to the podium where I am, Motions for the microphone. He grabs the microphone from me and he begins to talk. And as soon as he opens his mouth, he hits the ground, falling backwards on the ground. The ushers rush forward to the, to the front of the church to see what's going on with this man and if they can revive him. I take the mic and I ask if anyone in the congregation is a doctor or nurse and our own administrator, Pastor Rose, rushes to the front of the church. She kneels next to the man lying on the ground and she begins to examine him. Upon her examination, she says to the congregation, I need you all to begin to pray. Because this man is in the final stages of starvation. That he is so undernourished and so anemic, lacking nutrition, that given another 30 minutes, I would suggest, if he doesn't eat, he will die. So we see this situation is serious, right? I motion for um, the brothers to come and pick him up and put him in the chair on the first row. I've been motioned for Sister Denise, our chairman, director of hospitality, and I tell Denise, Sister Denise, please go and get this man something from our food pantry, our kitchen. And Denise goes, she brings back a sandwich, she brings back an apple and a banana, and she has two bottles of water for this man. I want you to stay with me. I'm going somewhere. I hurriedly present all of these items to the man and I ask him if he believes if he eats this food, he will get better. The man looks at me and says in a, in a very low voice, of course, I know I will get better. And then sarcastically he says, do you think I'm some kind of fool? He reiterates, yes, certainly, 
I believe that if I eat the food that you're offering, it will keep me from starving to death. Now, I want you to remember, our administrative pastor Rose advised that there was a 30 minute maximum if the man doesn't eat that he's going to die. Now, do you have this picture in your mind's eye? So 29 minutes and 54 seconds later, the man is on the front row heard saying, I believe that if I eat this food, it will keep me from starving to death. I absolutely believe that if I eat this food, it will definitely keep me from starving to death. But then the man plunges out of his chair onto the ground. Administrator Pastor Rose rushes to the side of the man. She examines him. She turns to me and the congregation. And you know what she says? The man has died. Now I want to ask you a question, another one. This is not a trick question. It's not designed to put you on the spot. But be honest about your answer. I told you this story to reveal something to you about the difference between faith and believing. Many people think they know what it is to walk by faith. And it is very obvious if you examine their lives very carefully, they do not know that they do not know. And sometimes, truth be told, someone who does not know they do not know is the hardest person in the world to get the point across to because they think they know. This entire scenario, this story that I painted for you is to ask you the question, would you say that what the starving man said he believed was absolutely true? Would you say that what the man said he believed was definitely true? Now, I, I can hear some of you through the, the, the screen saying yes. What he said he believed was absolutely, definitely true. So what the man believed was true. And it was also accurate. But yet what he believed didn't save his life. Why? Because he did not act on what he believed. I'm in my gym today. Again, as you all are aware. And the various pieces of equipment, the, the weight lifting equipment, the, the, the free weights, uh, uh, um, and the elliptical machine, all of this stuff here, I believe has the ability to help me get in shape and build muscles. But until my belief in the equipment and its ability to help me get in shape and build muscles is acted upon, I will see no results. God is saying to us today, faith is acting on what you believe. I need you to put that in comments. Faith is acting on what I believe. Believing something will never change your circumstance. But faith will change your circumstance. And faith is acting on what you believe. Come on, put in comments. If you have faith, act on it. Now, now believing is, is where we start. 
But if all you do is believe, there will be no life-changing results, my brother and my sister. That is why I submit to you many Christians throughout the years have been destroyed by the enemy. Because they believe God can heal them. Yet they are dying like flies. Their believing is right. Just like the man, the starving man, said that he believed that if he ate the food, it will keep him from starving to death. Yet he died. Starved with food right in front of him. Because he never ate it. He never acted on what he believed. He, he never acted on what he believed. You and I are not going to get healed because God can heal us. We have to find what it takes to get what God can do to what God will do. You, you and I, we can go to the grocery store. We can get a basket full of of food and walk down every aisle picking up food from every aisle and fill our basket with so much food that we can't even see past the pile of food. You can wheel your basket into the center aisle of the grocery store and cry as loud as you can. I believe that if I eat this food, it will keep me from starving to death. Everything you believe is absolutely true. That food will keep you from starving to death. But you can still die right in the center aisle of the grocery store with all of that food in your basket. Your hands on the basket. But until you open up the food and begin to eat it, you will die. Now James tells us that we must be doers of the word and not hearers only. That faith is acting on what we believe. When we chronicle the accounts of the miracles, the signs, and the wonders throughout the word of God, specifically the ones in the gospels that Jesus performed, we see a prevailing thread throughout the gospels that people's faith was tied to an action. If I would look at the centurion who had a paralyzed servant in Capernaum in Matthew chapter 8, the centurion went to Jesus for healing of his servant. It wasn't just good enough for the centurion to believe that Jesus could heal, but what we see this centurion demonstrate is what faith does. Faith acts on what it believes. This centurion, he was a man of authority, the text said. He tell people where to go and when to come. But what he did in exercising his authority, he didn't just sit in his office giving orders or just thinking. No, 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 he didn't. You, you see, he actually did something. He went to where Jesus was. And then he said something. He said something. How many of you say you believe God, but that's all you do? Another example is the disciples. When they experienced the great tempest on the sea in Luke chapter 8. The winds and the waves, the Bible records, be, began to blow uncontrollably and water started filling the boat. The disciples, what, what, they thought they were going to perish. So what did they do, y'all? They rushed to awake Jesus who was asleep in the lower part of the boat. They said to Jesus, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But notice what Jesus said. Notice what he did. He said, why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Now, faith if, if, if faith was just believing that the storm would stop and go away, the disciples wouldn't have had to do anything but just believe. 
But no. They go and wake Jesus, and Jesus says to them, Why are you fearful? Oh, ye of little faith. Jesus rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But there was no calm until Jesus arose and did something. When Jesus talked to them about their faith, he was talking about an action. He said to them, why are you fearful, you of little faith? He was referring to their inaction. Because remember, faith requires an action, not just believing something. The Bible says that Jesus arose and he did not just arise, but he looked at the storm. Looked at the, the winds and the sea. And what did he do? He rebuked it. He didn't just rebuke, but he specifically rebuked the wind and the sea. But what was their little faith? Their little faith was doing nothing except reacting to the circumstances. Instead of responding to the circumstances, my God. They reacted in fear and Jesus responded in faith. Can you see that? He did not just believe that what was going to, that what was going to happen would happen if somebody didn't do anything. Jesus spoke to the situation. He believed if he did something about the storm, the storm would have to respond. So he rose, he rebuked the winds and the sea. But if it was left to the disciples, I submit they probably would have sunk in that boat that day. Because they weren't responding. They were reacting in fear. What am I trying to get to you, get you to see? That faith is acting on what you believe. Not just believing something. How many of us have a knee-jerk response when a tough situation or, or circumstance arise? We get a bad doctor's report and, 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 and the first thing that comes out of our mouths is Christian, Christians, I believe God. You lose your job and, and you say, I'm believing God for a better job. But your believing God never moves into faith. How do I know that, you may ask? Because if you have faith, there is a su subsequent action that will follow your declaration. Every example that I could find throughout the four Gospels of Jesus performing miracles, healing, signs, and wonders, belief was followed with an action which showed faith. You don't believe me? The woman with the issue of blood. She believed and then she acted by touching the hem of his garment. Jesus replied, woman, it is thy faith that hath made thee whole. The four friends with the paralyzed gentleman, they heard about Jesus being in town. So what did they do? They acted, their faith was, their belief system was prompted, so they acted. They went to the house where Jesus was. They couldn't get in the house because the house was full to capacity. So what did they do? They tore off the roof of the house to get their paralyzed friend to Jesus. They believed and therefore they acted. The Bible said when, when Jesus saw their faith, how did he see their faith? By their actions. There was two blind men in Matthew 9th chapter. Be, these men cried out to Jesus. 
And then they came to Jesus because they were blind. Their action caused them to move. Their believing caused them to move. Jesus laid his hands on them and their eyes were open. And notice what Jesus says to them. According to your faith, let it be unto you. Why didn't Jesus just say, according to your believing? Because believing doesn't move God. Faith moves God. And faith always acts. Jesus is not moved by what we believe if what we believe doesn't move us to action. Faith is never something just to be talked about. It is something that must be demonstrated in the way we live. If you don't live it, if you don't believe it, you won't see any actions. So J James says uh, again to us in chapter 2, verse 18, show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. My sister, my brother, what you and I must understand is that what keeps us from walking in faith is doubt. Doubt is the cycle that keeps us living beneath our spiritual privileges. Situations will occur and, and we must make a decision. Yes, we believe God but will our belief in God move us into action, into faith? I feel like I'm helping someone today. Will your faith in God cause you to move out from the comfort of the possibilities to the realities of God's power? Each step of faith reveals a willingness to trust God. It's your act of obedience and my act of obedience that shows we believe God. But in stepping out, your belief has turned into an action. When, 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 because God is faithful. He cannot lie. His word will not return to him void. When you trust his word, you act on his word. I've been assigned to shake up someone's comfort zone. You've settled for living in that place of faith that you've been in for the last five, ten years. But God is calling you to another level of faith. You, you, you become comfortable. Life has rocked and settled you in. You, you have all that you think you want but God has more that he desires for you so, so God is disrupting your normal he's moving the line he, he's speaking again he, he's leading you and prompting you to take a new step in faith and come out of the cycle yeah I know the fear of the unknown taunts us and, and haunts us. But this time, my brother, my sister, he wants me to tell you how you can move through this next season. Are you ready? By breaking the cycle of doubt. Will you launch out into the deep, the, 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 the safe place of his will? Or will you retract into the cycle of doubt and comfort? Will you leap forward or backwards? I, I don't know who this message is for. But I came to tell you that each step of faith, as hard as it may be, it leads to new levels of faith. And breaks the cycle of doubt. Now let me tell you, and I'm almost done. Let me tell you how the cycle of doubt impacts your faith. As we learned earlier, faith is persuasion.
persuasion, credence, moral conviction of the truthfulness of God. It's one's profession or confession. It's an action. Faith commits to and entrusts. It, 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 it's when you commit yourself or entrust yourself to the promises of God. You trust his word. No matter the circumstance, no, no matter the issue, no matter the struggle, faith says, I won't focus on what I see, Peter. Come walk on the water. Faith causes us to step out, to act on what we believe, to entrust ourselves to the one we believe in. Well, doubt, on the other hand, literally means to oppose, separate, or withdraw from faith. It doesn't mean that, that you don't have a moment of questioning or wondering. It doesn't mean that you don't wake up some days and, and your level of confidence may not be as high. On this journey of faith, my sister, my brother, just being honest, those are seasons of the soul that you will experience. But when you move into doubt, you do the exact opposite of faith. You separate, you oppose, you withdraw, or there's no action on God's word. To doubt means that you turn away from what God said. That you don't act on what God said. That you find yourself going in these circles of constant doubt. You say you believe God. But your belief never moves into action, faith. So, so, so what happens is because you don't move into action, you see no results. And then the enemy tells you, see, I told you that this faith thing isn't real. What you have just done was validated your own doubt. And you move further away from believing and trusting God's word. And this cycle continues until it spills over into every area of your life. Ultimately, sister, brother, you find yourself confessing, this faith thing doesn't work for me. Not realizing, doubt is not a feeling. But faith is not a feeling either. They produce feelings, but they are decisions based on either committing to or opposing the word of God. And get this, both doubt and fear are revealed through our actions. In our text today, this is what Jesus is teaching them. That when 